favor. Welcome, everyone. Uh, as Cindy passes out the uh, the real Danishes and coffee for everybody in person, and I see there are several people there, maybe a dozen or more, uh, in person at the Bemis Point Golf Course and Tap House, uh, we will pass out virtual Danishes, croissants, and coffee to those of you who are joining us online. <laughs> Good news is that those are low in calories, and those of us that are you know, watching our weight and trying to get in shape, you know, will not suffer, you know, from that. I'd like to welcome everybody to our March history talk here at the Flubana Community Historical Society. Um, we're glad that um, everyone was able to join us. We have several people who are online from uh, throughout uh, Chautauqua County, Western New York and beyond. Uh, and so welcome. And we also have, as I just mentioned, uh, several people who are in person, um, in Bemis Point today at the Bemis Point uh, Golf Club. We certainly want to thank uh, Bemis Point Golf Club and Tap House for hosting us this particular uh, month. We thought it would be apropos to have a, the uh, our history talk focusing on golf in Western New York uh, at a golf course. So it was it's been great to have you guys there. Um, and for us to be there and that you're hosting us and we really appreciate that. We also want to thank uh, certainly Oak Hill Country Club um, uh, here in Rochester where I happen to be sitting today where Fred is sitting from uh, uh, sitting at uh, Fred, uh, our guest speaker, and I'll introduce him in just a second here. Um, uh, is a board member at Oak Hill Country Club and they are most gracious and offering up his services and uh, to to come and talk to us today about this fascinating topic, which I know we're all eager to get to. So I will not um, uh, uh, belabor this much longer. Just a couple of housekeeping uh, measures that I want to make sure that we mention before we get started. Fred is more than happy to take your questions. Uh, and uh, we do have a question time at the end, uh, but you don't have to save your questions until then. If you uh, do have any questions, I know this will be a little easier for people who are attending online. Just unmute yourself uh, and then uh, unmute yourself and then go ahead and ask the question. Uh, you can also, uh, for those of those attending online, you can also ask a question in the chat. Um, I'm making sure to monitor that, as is Austin Wilson. So, uh, uh, you know, between the two of us, we'll be able to, to certainly ask the questions. For those of you in person, if you have any questions, both at the question time or during the meeting, just uh, make sure to get a hold of Austin or Hung or uh, Cindy and or, 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 or Tinker. And they will uh, unmute the the mic uh, in the room, and we'll make sure to ask the question. We'll repeat it so everybody can hear it, uh, and then we'll go from there. So, uh, the if without further ado, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, our our topic for this month, as I said earlier, is uh, golf in Western New York, which uh, as as certainly I can even call myself a novice, as somebody who is an outsider in the golf world. Uh, I did not realize until I started researching the subject and talking with Fred and others, the deep, deep history that golf has here in Western New York and throughout our region. Um, and and, and uh, the and really the, the storied and the famed history of places like Oak Hill Country Club um, and the like. We especially think that this is a, a timely discussion. Uh, for those people who are golf uh, fans and aficionados, as well as for people who are uh, uh, curious and interested about the game of golf, we think this is really uh, uh, in, an important subject to cover because 
this coming May, we have the PGA Championship returning to uh, Western New York at Oak Hill Country Club. And what a what a what a testimony to you know the the um, you know the 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 fan base that we have in Western New York, as well as the in, um, important golf institutions that we have around here that the PGA is returning uh, to 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 the region. Uh, the our guest speaker today is Fred Belts. He uh, comes from and hails from Rochester, uh, New York. He has over 40 years of experience working in the financial services interest industry, and he's a managing partner at Belts, uh, IANI, and, and Associates. Uh, he graduated high school uh, while a Rotary student, and this is going to come as especially interesting for those of us uh, from Southern Chautauqua County. Uh, mm -hmm. He uh, graduated um, as a Rotary Exchange student in Southern Sweden. So we have an honorary Svenska Poika with us, or maybe you are a Svenska Poika by, <laughs> by, by descent, but uh, that was certainly interesting. And we'd love to hear your stories on that as well too, Fred. Uh, that led him to certainly pursue his education further at Georgetown University, where he um, was uh, graduated from the School of Foreign Service in 1971. Uh, so the fascinating stories, he's traveled all over Europe, and, and again, you're welcome, Fred, to, to talk on that subject some more. We'd love to hear those stories as well. Um, Fred is also actively involved uh, throughout the community. He's served on various community boards, including the Garth Vagan Dance, Rochester Arts and Lectures, and as a trustee of Paul Smith's College. What especially brings him here today, though, is his love of the golf. Uh, he's an avid collector of golf antiques. Um, he served on the board, as I mentioned a little earlier, or I should say he serves on the board, as I mentioned a little earlier, at the Oak Hill Country Club, of which we're going to hear quite a bit here this morning about uh, that, that uh, famous country club. And he's been on that board for 12 or 15 years, uh, currently serving as the country club's uh, historian since 2005. I know there's a lot more to say, but I don't want to belabor this. I know we want to jump right into the subject. So, uh, Fred, welcome. We're glad to have you here and take it away. Thank you very much, Rick, and uh, thank everyone. Uh, I appreciate your having me uh, this morning to share a little bit of uh, Oak Hills history and a little bit of the region's uh, golf history. Um, feel free to ask questions along the way. Um, and um, uh, with that, why don't we just get started? Um, I, what I'd like to do is run through sort of a relatively brief history of Oak Hill and then open it up to more general questions anyone might have about Sweden, for that matter, or Oak Hill or golf in Western New York. So um, why don't we call up the first slide? Okay, so you're looking at the very first clubhouse. Uh, Oak Hill was founded in 1901. We were not the first golf club in uh, the Rochester area. That was the Country Club of Rochester in 1895. But um, a group of 26 gentlemen uh, watching how much fun everybody was having at the Country Club decided to form their own club and um, they leased uh, 80 acres uh, on the Genesee River. And the photograph, you can see just a little hint of the river there on the left, uh, and uh, which included the, the farmhouse, which served as the, as the clubhouse. It was pretty rudimentary, um, kerosene lamps, no hot water. The rules were pretty, pretty simple. Uh, you know, uh, no swearing or smoking cigars in the dining room and um, no betting on anything, including golf. Uh, the barn you see in the background on the right is where the uh, lockers were kept. So you could change your clothes in the, in the barn. And it was a nine hole course. And I joke that uh, I, I don't know who designed the course. I suspect it was a group of guys with a shovel and uh, flower pots for the, for the holes. But uh, in any event, that was in 1901. And uh, there were 26 uh, business and professional individuals. And 
And the club grew quite quickly. Almost immediately, they signed up about 140 uh, members. Um, the initiation was $25 a year, and the dues were $20 a year. Um, quickly realized that that wasn't enough. And so uh, three years later, the dues were raised to $40 a, month, uh, a year and $5 per additional family member. Uh, it wasn't just a golf course. There was a lot of skiing and sledding. Uh, mm -hmm. People enjoyed the uh, Genesee River for canoeing and sailing, um, but uh, it was uh, primarily a golf club. Okay, why don't we go to the second slide? So this is a photograph, coincidentally, or of interest. I found this photograph at a garage sale, um, but uh, instantly knew what it was and bought it. But uh, it's a photograph of the um, new and improved country club uh, clubhouse for Oak Hill that was built in 1911. That same year, uh, the course was expanded to 18 holes. Um, we, we don't know uh, who designed the second nine, although there is some evidence to, 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 uh, sub, um, to support the fact that it was Donald Ross had some discussions, as did Walter Travis, who was another great golfer of the area. But as you can see, this was a much more substantial clubhouse. The membership had now grown to about 250 people and uh, there were sleeping rooms, there were club rooms, there were, you know, uh, baths. Uh, it, was a, it was a real clubhouse and, and that was in 1911. And um, for, uh, following that for the next 10, 12 years, Everybody was very happy. Um, it was a great clubhouse. The membership was strong um, and people were enjoying golf. Uh, then around 1922, uh, a group of individuals from the University of Rochester supported by uh, uh, George Eastman uh, decided that they needed to expand the University of Rochester and to build a dental and medical school. There was some discussion about the most appropriate place. Uh, the decision was that they wanted to have the uh, Oak Hill property. I mean, negotiations were started and um, it concluded with what I would called the greatest land swap in Western New York history. This clubhouse plus the then 90 acres and 18 holes of, of golf were swapped for 355 acres in uh, the town of Pittsford. Two courses, two 18 hole courses designed by Donald Ross uh, and a very commodious uh, uh, a Tudor clubhouse. And we can go to the next slide and that'll show you the clubhouse. Uh, uh, this is this is a clubhouse um, photograph is, is about taken about 1930. Uh, you can see that there are porches all the way around. There's obviously it was pre-air conditioning days, but this was a very substantial and beautiful clubhouse. And um, so um, believe it or not, back when the debate was going on, there were some members that felt that they, they were happy with uh, the location along the river, but the decision was made that well, it would be best for both the club and the city of Rochester and the university to support that, that endeavor. And so they moved to Pittsford. Uh, interestingly enough, the... Uh, Pittsford was felt to be too far away for some folks on the west side of Rochester to travel. And as, uh, as uh, legend has it, that spurred the uh, building of Brook Lee Country Club, which is on the west side, uh, built around the same time, also a Donald Ross uh, golf course. Um, so, 
Um, you know, here we were. Uh, the course opened in the spring of 1926. The work was actually done, uh, finished in 1925, but they let the course, um, the grass was all uh, grass seed. There, there, there was no uh, uh, turf at the time. And so uh, they gave it uh, another year uh, so that uh, the, the grass uh, could support golfing. And, uh, and Oak Hill uh, really um, almost immediately became a site of, of, of golf, golf tournaments, and, and it was almost immediately recognized as a unique piece of property for uh, competitive, uh, high quality competitive golf, both the West Course and the East Course. You know, everybody knows the East course, the West, uh, if it weren't for the East, I think the West would be considered the finest golf course in Western New York. There's really only about a stroke and a half difference between the East and the West. Um, but uh, let's go to the next slide. In 1927, Tommy Armour, now this was only a year after the club was founded, Tommy Armour came and gave an exhibition. And then in 1930, uh, the very first women's New York State Amateur was hosted at, uh, at Oak Hill. And here you have Maureen Orcott on the left, uh, congratulating Helen Hicks, the first New York State women's amateur champion. She received a cup, which is still known as the Oak Hill Cup. And, and, uh, and then not too far after that, in 1934, there was what we call the Hagen Centennial. And it was the 20th anniversary of Walter Hagen's uh, first US Open win uh, in 1914. An interesting aside is in 1913 is the uh, famous match with uh, uh, where Francis Wilmet, the young uh, caddy, uh, beat the two greatest golfers of all time, Harry Varden, and um, um, uh, the name is escaping me. It'll come back in a second. Um, uh, uh, for the U.S. Open win. Uh, what people don't remember is that the gentleman who came in fourth was Walter Hagen. And then the very next year, uh, he gained permission from uh, the country club to travel and uh, compete in the 1914 U.S. Open, which he won. And uh, the rest is really history. But in any event, the 1934 Hagen Centennial was a celebration of that 20th anniversary of Hagen's win and also a celebration of the uh, centennial of Oak Hill, uh, excuse me, the centennial of the city of Rochester's incorporation. I date uh, that event to uh, really the beginning of uh, Oak Hill and the East Course's um, um, position in, with the with the greatest golfers uh, in the world. You know, Walter Hagen had been arguably the the greatest professional golfer of that era, and uh, and made great friends. He was. Uh, uh, quite an individual, and um, and as such, uh, he invited his friends, and who happened to be the greatest golfers in the world, and uh, that's when the that's when the world saw the East Course for the first time. Yeah, the event was won by uh, Leo Deagle. Um, then, uh, shortly after that, why don't we go to the next slide? Um, a few years later, in 1941, uh, um, Frank Annette, that's Frank Annette in the center of the picture holding the check. Uh, Frank Annette, who is founder of uh, Gannett News, now USA Today, was a member at, uh, at Oak Hill, and he sponsored the 1941 uh, Times Union Open. Um, the Times Union, for those who don't know, was the evening newspaper in Rochester. And um, 
On the left is Craig Wood, a uh, great golfer of the era. Uh, reaching over Gannett's uh, shoulder is Ben Hogan. He's reaching for the check that went to Sam Sneed, who won the 41 times union. Uh, but um, uh, uh, Hagen, uh, Hogan would not be disappointed because in 1942, uh, Oak Hill again hosted the another Times Union Open. It, it almost didn't come about because at that point in time, the United States was in the Second World War and there was some question about whether it was unseemly to be playing golf, you know, during, during that time period. Uh, but nonetheless, um, in 1942, the Times Union uh, Open was played, and uh, Ben Hogan would win. Uh, of interest is that Hogan, in the opening round, shot a course record of 64. That course record lasted for 71 years. Now, you think about it, there are not a lot of sports uh, records that last uh, for 71 years, almost three quarters of a century. Um, and it wasn't, uh, uh, it wasn't until uh, 2013 when Jason Duffner shot a 63 during the PGA Championship uh, that uh, replaced that, uh, that record. Um, but then, you know, obviously there was a period of time during uh, the Second World War where um, there was not a lot of golf, and uh, we can go to the next uh, the next slide. And uh, but in 1949, uh, the United States Golf Association came to Oak Hill and asked them to host uh, the U.S. Amateur, the 1949 U.S. Amateur. Uh, today, the amateur, while a significant tournament, is not considered a major, although in that time period, uh, the amateur was considered a major. Uh, I always refer back to uh, uh, Bobby Jones in the 1930 quadrilateral, where, you know, he won the Grand Slam of, of the U.S. Open, the British Open, and the U.S. Amateur and the British Amateur. Those were the four majors uh, back then. And in 49, uh, this was considered a major. On the left here, you see, this is an interesting photograph. On the left is Charlie Coe, who won the 1949 Am. Uh, probably the, one of the greatest golfers, uh, amateur golfers of all time, uh, right up there, not quite at the same level of Bobby Jones, but um, uh, Charlie Coe, for example, was a six time low amateur at the Masters and came within a stroke of winning the Masters one year. On the right is Dr. Williams and uh, uh, Dr. John R. Williams is a really a patriarch of Oak Hill. Um, he was a physician who uh, in his late 40s retired uh, to become an amateur arborist. And um, people today don't realize that in 1926, when Oak Hill moved to the now property, that was basically farmed out land. It was barren, there were very few trees on the property, and there were a number of attempts to landscape the property, uh, all of them unsuccessful. And then Dr. Williams uh, asked permission to give it a go. And he had a fellow arborist from around the world, a great forest in, uh, of the United States, a great forest of Europe and parts of Asia to send him acorns. And he received hundreds of acorns from different parts of the world, uh, all the great forests. Uh, and um, uh, he planted them in coffee cans in his backyard. And the joke is he must have really loved coffee because, uh, you know, there were hundreds of acorns sprouted. And, um, and from that, he built nurseries around the club. And, and he treed uh, Oak Hill uh, to what you see today, which is uh, a beautiful, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, array of, of trees. Uh, Dr. Williams was asked at one point in time how many trees he had planted, and he said he stopped counting at 30,000. So, yeah, you get, it gives you an idea. The other thing of interest is the plaque that's on the tree. Oak Hill is well known for its various plaques around the trees. And this was a way Dr. Williams uh, was able to raise money. Uh, there would be a celebration of uh, a, a member or a family member that had passed or a member's accomplishment, and they would put plaques on trees. And this was one of the ways Dr. Williams raised money to do his arbor work. But this one in particular uh, to uh, Charlie Coe, uh, and then that, that same week, he gave one to the Walker Cup team, which was in, at Oak Hill to compete in the U.S. Uh, amateur. This, in my opinion, is the genesis of what we call the Hill of Fame. And the Hill of Fame is the amphitheater around the 13th hole uh, that has plaques dedicated to the uh, great individuals of golf. Um, it, it really started, this I believe is the genesis, although it really started in 1956 formally. And uh, there are now 43 individuals installed on the Hill of Fame. Uh, great golfers in 2013, Tom Watson. Um, I don't know if this is public knowledge yet or not, but there will be another one uh, uh, during the tournament. Um, um, and um, uh, I mean, in 56, uh, Bobby Jones, Dwight Eisenhower, um, great golfers, including um, Byron Nelson, Jack Nicklaus, uh, Lee Trevino, uh, all have plaques on the Hill of Fame. But this photograph, I believe, is the, the genesis of that. With that, why don't we move on a little bit? Uh, yeah, in 1949 uh, was the AM, and, and the USGA was so pleased. Uh, Joe Dye, as a matter of fact, was quoted as saying in 1949, where have you been for the last 20 years? Well, they came right back in 1956 and asked Oak Hill to host the uh, United States Open, which uh, here you have a Dr. Kerry Middlecoff on the left, the winner, and with him was uh, Ben Hogan again. Uh, Hogan was hoping to uh, win his fifth U.S. Open. It wasn't to be in the final round on the 17th hole. He missed a, uh, a three-foot putt, and uh, that would have tied him with Middlecoff for a playoff. Uh, middle cough one and um you know it was uh really now oak hill is in the uh, major tournament business um 12 years later um uh, why don't we slip to the next slide 12 years later uh lee trevino would uh win the 1968 uh, U.S. Open, that's Jack Nicholas uh, again, admiring the trophy. Uh, this was Trevino's first uh, uh, professional win. And of course, he picked the biggest one to, uh, to do it. And um, the, the, the 68 Open was something because in, um, it was the first time in a PGA championship that the winner had all four rounds in the uh, 60s. And um, that was, that had never happened before. And that combined with a lot of the significant trees on the course uh, succumbing to the Dutch elm disease led some to believe that perhaps Oak Hill was no longer of major championship quality or challenge. Um, Oak Hill had requested another championship. The way, the, the way it's done is you invite the USGA to come to your course or your club for a championship. So Oak Hill had invited the USGA to come back for a tournament in the mid uh, to late uh, 1970s. Uh, word came back that 
you know, G USGA just wasn't sure that this was uh, Oak Hill was of U.S. Open quality. This was a big concern to uh, everybody, the membership and the leadership of the club, because we'd come to really enjoy this and and uh, and think of ourselves as something special because of it. Uh, so uh, what happened was the um, the fathers uh, brought in George and Tom Fazio, well-known golf architects at the time, to, um, if you will, add some muscle to the course, solve a few other problems, which they did. Now, the, the changes the Fazios made were controversial because there were three holes that they changed quite radically and no longer really fit the Donald Ross look and feel. But nonetheless, uh, it, it, the Fazio's work was very successful, um, and uh, because um, the the um, in 1980 the PGA came for the first time to uh, to Oak Hill. We could go to the next slide, um, uh, which was in 1980. Uh, this is Jack Nicholas on, on the left and a Mr. Conti, who was the uh, executive director of the, uh, of the PGA of America on the right, holding the Wanamaker Trophy. Uh, but um, Nicholas, uh, at the end of 72 holes, at the end of the tournament, the only player under par was Jack Nicholas. And so if there was any question about the difficulty or the challenge that the Oak Hill East course offered, uh, those were vanquished. Uh, the next closest player was, was two over. So, um, you know, there, no doubt now the greatest players in the world and only one could finish under par. And I often say that, you know, the work of Fazio's, if, if the, if the goal was to have uh, Oak Hill slotted for major championships, it was a huge success because starting 1980, approximately every five years since and going into the future today, Oak Hill has hosted a significant or major tournament every five years. And uh, now if the goal was to have a major championship site and a, a traditional Donald Ross course, well, then maybe not so much because three of the holes were, were had changed significantly. But uh, following 80, uh, Oak Hill be, uh, hosted the um, 84 uh, Senior Open. It was one of the first uh, Senior Opens. Uh, it was the fourth Senior Open. Uh, and it was won by Miller Barber. Uh, the great story in my mind is on the final round on the 15th hole, uh, Arnold Palmer was walked up to tap in a putt that was sitting on the edge of the hole. His club hit in front and bounced over the, uh, over the ball, uh, which is a stroke, which he called on himself. Nobody else had seen it. And yet it's the nature of golf that he knew it was his intent to tap the ball in the hole. It didn't go in and he called a stroke on himself. And as a result, uh, there was not a playoff. In 89, and I think we can jump to the next, uh, the next, yeah, in 1989, Curtis Strange uh, won the, uh, the third uh, US Open that Oak Hill had hosted. Um, Curtis Strange, this was back to back. Curtis Strange had won the uh, U.S. Open also in 1988, first person to do that since Ben Hogan. Uh, and it, um, 89, and then in 1995, we can go to the next one. Uh, in 95, Oak Hill was asked to host the, uh, the Ryder Cup, which uh, was just a phenomenal uh, if anyone's ever uh, attended a, a Ryder Cup, you realize that there's a spirit there and excitement that um, uh, it, you can't find elsewhere. Um, you know, it's two teams uh, for their 
you know, um, competing rather than individuals. And there's a really a different flavor of team and international uh, um, competition that comes with the Ryder Cup. Uh, I'll tell a, fel a funny story on myself. Um, the European team um, uh, arrived in, in a uh, in the Concord at the time, the SST. And uh, I was in the, uh, on the Oak Hill grounds. It was a large tent with great big televisions. And the commentator goes, uh, and now the, the Concord is circling the Oak Hill property. And I go, wow, how cool is that? And I'm looking at it and all of a sudden I go, wait a minute, I'm at Oak Hill. And I ran out the door to watch the Concord circle the property, which was, uh, which was uh, great fun. Um, after the 95 Ryder Cup, uh, we hosted the 98 uh, U.S. Amateur, won by Hank Keeney. Uh, following that, we hosted the uh, 2003 PGA. We can jump to the next slide, you know, which is uh, um, uh, a great tournament. It was won by Sean McKeel. This was his final shot into the 72nd hole from 175 yards. He put a seven iron two inches from the hole. And, uh, you know, I'm, I guarantee you, you'll see that shot a dozen times during the uh, upcoming PGA. The club put a plaque uh, out at the spot where he hit that shot from. And uh, I think every member I know, and whenever I have a guest out, we always stop there and you know, I say, hey, drop a ball and take a seven iron and see how you can do. But that was uh, that was just a, a, a great moment in time. 2008, Oak Hill hosted the Senior PGA Championship, uh, um, which was won by Jay Haas. And with that, uh, Oak Hill became the first and the only club in the United States to host all six men's major championships that rotate. That would be the United States Amateur, the United States Open, the United States Senior Open, the PGA Championship, the Ryder Cup, and the, and the, uh, the, the PGA Championship, the Ryder Cup, and the Senior PGA Championship. And uh, we have replicas of all six trophies in our trophy room. It's a pretty dramatic thing to see. Uh, so that was in 2008. Then in 2013, we can jump to the next. Uh, Jason Duffner would win uh, the PGA Championship, setting a course record of 63. Um, you know, I'm very torn about that. It was, uh, I had done a thing for CBS Sports on golf history at Oak Hill. Uh, it was supposed to air the same day Duffner shot the 63. I ended up on the editor's floor and, and Duffner got all the credit on, and rightfully so, uh, on television. It was also a little hard to see, you know, Oak Hill has always been very proud of uh, the, the, the challenge it presents and to see uh, that record of Ben Hogan's in seven, uh, that was 71. And by the way, of 64, set 71 years before. And I should have mentioned in, during the 89 uh, US Open, Curtis Strange matched that record of 64. But now uh, Jason Duffner uh, finishes with a 63. Um, again, I console myself a little bit to say, the PGA had set the course up on the quote unquote easier side. We had uh, graduated rough rather than, you know, fairway right into the rough, the rough being one of Oak Hill's major uh, defenses, if you will, um, the graduated rough and we had quite a bit of rain. So the, the greens were receptive to shots and the, uh, and the ball got a lot more roll because of the graduated rough. But, you know, that's not to take anything away from Jason Duffner. He, uh, 
uh, he set the record and uh, he certainly deserves it. Um, so going forward from that in, in 2019, Oak Hill again hosted the Senior PGA, uh, won by Ken Tanagawa. It's a great story of a fellow who had tried to play on the tour, uh, didn't do well, uh, went back and got his amateur status back again, and um, then decided uh, almost on the spur of the moment, because it was in his hometown, to uh, try and qualify for the uh, senior PGA, which he, uh, which he did, and uh, a virtual unknown, he went on to win. And uh, so that was exciting. And, um, and now that rolls us up to uh, 2019. As soon as that senior uh, PGA was over, the course entered into a, um, a major renovation. And um, the entire East course was renovated with all of the greens and all of the bunkers going through a major uh, a complete renovation. And there were a couple reasons for that. Uh, one is the greens and bunkers needed to be renovated anyway, especially the greens over the years as players hit out of the bunkers and sand comes onto the green slowly but surely, imperceptibly, but nonetheless, sand begins to build up and those tend to warp the shape of the green. Uh, the other thing is uh, after years and years of mowing um, uh, holes that they, they, they tend to take on a circular shape, uh, which was not the shape of the, of the uh, greens that Ross designed. So there was need to uh, repair that also to uh, build out the bunkers. So Oak Hill um, put together a committee, hired the golf architect Andrew Green to come in. Uh, Green has done some great uh, Ross restorations um, and, uh, and worked on some very major clubs. Um, and um, it, was, uh, it was controversial time because an awful lot of trees were taken down. And uh, at the very beginning is the bulldozers are coming in and tearing up the course and the trees are being cut down. Um, a lot of members were wondering what, what the devil did we do here? But uh, in, in the end, uh, everybody is really excited about uh, the the new look, um, the three holes that were that the Fazio, uh, Fazios had done were five, six, and fifteen. Uh, those were brought back to the look and feel of Donald Ross. And if we jump to the next slide, you can see this is the new number five. It's a um, hundred and eighty yard par three. It's um, uh, it replicates very closely, not in the same location, but it replicates very closely uh, the look of the original uh, uh, um, par three, which which uh, the Fazios took out. Um, it's called Little Poison, and it's a handful. It plays longer than the 180. Uh, you can't be left, right, short, or long without being in trouble. Those bunkers, you can't really see it, but they're about six or seven foot deep. So in many cases, you've got uh, a, a, tough, a tough challenge coming out. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this, is, this, is number, this is now number six. And this was known uh, at the time before the Fazios did their work as one of the greatest holes uh, in America. Uh, and we believe it is now uh, that way again. And you're looking back from the green back down the fairway. As you can see, the Allen's Creek, uh, Creek comes around the green and then goes all the way down the left fairway. You can't see it, but the willow tree is, is at the tee. This plays as a 500-yard par four for the professionals from the tips with the Allen's Creek 
all of down the whole right side of the fairway. And as you can see, the green slants towards the creek. So this, this is now for the members, the number one handicap hole. And it's expected this will be a real challenge for the, uh, for the professionals. And then one more slide. And this is 15. This is the par three that used to have the pond on the one side, uh, very non Ross like. And once again, we're looking at the green uh, and then back to the T. Um, and it's, it, you can see it's, it's really um, a much more uh, Ross like. And so um, that kind of brings me to the end of what I was thinking I would talk about, but um, I don't know where we are time-wise. I don't have a watch in front of me, but... Um, You're good to go. We have another uh, about, what is it, 15, 25 minutes, 20 minutes or so. Fine. Very good. You know, I'm happy to tell stories. I'm happy to answer questions. What, what does anybody want to know about? Yeah. So you can unmute your mics for those of people who are online if there's questions. Uh, for uh, from people in the room, uh, we have Austin, who's both looking online and can take your questions in person. Uh, yeah, I had one question that was texted to me. Okay. It's actually from Rick here, but he was wondering what, what requirements are needed for a golf course to be considered for holding a PGA or LPGA tournament? Right. Well, um... I think uh, I'll answer that slightly differently in what I'll say about why Rochester has become a site for so many professional tournaments, both uh, LPGA, which we Locust Hill hosted for years and years. Uh, um, Arondequoit uh, had uh, hosted um, uh, some of the um, um, Hooters tour, uh, and of course, Oak Hill, the, uh, some of the majors. And I, I, I think it's a number of things. One is, um, you know, you want a, a competitive course. You want a course where, you know, the, the players are going to be challenged, where you're going to see a great play. But also, um, you need a community that is uh, dedicated to hosting major tournaments. And I'll use as an example, um, I believe that the PGA, the 2023 PGA will have approximately 4,000 volunteers. When, that, when the offer to volunteer for the, for the 2023 PGA went out, there were, there were enough responses within we had all the responses we needed within 24 hours. So within 24 hours, we had not only 4,000 volunteers, but we had had a waiting list. And that kind of uh, community commitment to uh, a tournament is vital. And uh, I think one of the other things for both Locust Hill, uh, when it was hosting the LPGA and Oak Hill, is that uh, we have... It's more than a tradition of hosting major tournaments. It's, it's we have teams of people. So for example, whatever the area of the volunteers is, whether it's credentials, whether it's uniform, whether it's uh, safety and first aid, whether it's security, whether it's, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, whatever it is, there are uh, groups of people who uh, have done it year after year after year, Judy and I, uh, have have um, you know hosted or or been volunteers since 1994 and uh, 1998, excuse me, uh, with the amateur and um, ever since then. Uh, so we'll you know we we are act as volunteers. Judy will be a volunteer this year. Uh, I'm on the chairman's advisory committee as the club and event historian but you know again it's it's you have these group of people and and somebody who is the chair for one tournament may step aside and one of the vice chairs steps up and and so on and so forth so we have a 
continuum of volunteers who know what they're doing. So uh, maybe that's uh, a little bit longer than I planned, but that gives you some idea, I hope. Any other questions? Hello? We can't quite hear you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, oh, we can hear you, Fred. We can can't you hear, hear me? Oh, yes, now okay. we can hear you. <laughs> okay, get a little closer. So I was just wondering if anyone's matched Duffner's record. No, not yet. You know, <laughs> not yet. Um, that, that his record of 63 on the East Course uh, continues to uh, uh, continues to exist. You know, it, it one I, I recently in a, a, a wrote an article uh, for the Rochester Business Journal come out, I think during the tournament, where I said in in my mind, uh, you know, the two uh, most momentous, not necessarily the most popular, but the two momentous. Uh, tournaments for Oak Hill was the 1980 PGA because following that we that put us in the loop of hosting major tournaments on a very regular basis every five years and um, that really changed uh, Oak Hill's uh, per, the perception of Oak Hill as as a site uh, and I think 2023 is going to be the other one. Um, you know, uh, how will the professionals handle um, this restored course? I mean, you know, on the one hand, you could say a lot of the trees that used to uh, be a challenge for the professionals are now are now gone. On the other hand, the course is longer. Uh, the bunkers are significantly more difficult and deeper and uh the question is you know we'll see i mean um for example number four which is the dog leg par five used to be the easiest hole for the golf professionals uh they'd cut that corner and go over the bunkers that would sit in the corner of the dog leg um well they've they've created a new tee and so adding about 60 yards to that hole. So that hole will come in at 615 yards and 320 needed to clear the bunkers. And the question is, you know, how many of the pros, obviously if they want to, they can hit the ball that far, but do they want to do that with bunkers on uh, 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 and uh, out of bounds down the right-hand side? I think number five, which is the, 500 yard or excuse me number six which is the 500 yard par four um our signature hole uh which is number 13 the hill of fame uh, which has the creek uh in the middle is now has been pushed back to 625 yards so that's you know an, an uphill par five at 625 yards with a creek in the middle uh, is going to be a challenge. So the question is, how will they? How will the professionals play that course? And uh, in my article, I quoted Tiger Woods uh, following uh, the uh, 2003 PGA, where he called Oak Hill the hardest, fairest course he's ever played, or they, that the professionals have ever played. And uh, I believe that um, there will be similar quotes following the 2023. And if that's the case, then we'll have lots of more uh, major tournaments going into the future. And so lots more opportunities for players to break uh, Duffner's record, but they're going to have to be on their game because uh, I don't think the course is is going to uh, uh, give up uh, low scores. So, of course, that's all that what, that's all dependent on how the PGA sets the course up. Oak Hill does not set up the course; it's the PGA that sets up the course. So, for about ten days out, they they control the course and they set up the rough and the speed of the greens and everything else. But to answer your question, hopefully, no one has shot a 62, but hopefully 
there will be lots of opportunities for people to. So that's a long-winded answer. Um, okay. I know we have another question in person, and then we'll get to you, Judy, online. Sure. Okay. Oh, um, two quick ones. Uh, sure. What's what's the anxiety about uh, the major moving to May since it was announced, and um, and how that might impact the conditions? And uh, what's what else is on the the future in terms of tournaments? Any women's tournaments? Or I know the amateur I think is scheduled. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, the the U.S. amateurs coming back in twenty seven. Um, certainly Oak Hill is open to a major women's championship or, or, or a, a team event. Um, there is a future tournaments committee of which I am not part and they're very secretive. I know that there have been discussions with the USGA and discussions with the PGA where those are all going. I don't know. But you raise a, 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 you know, an interesting question because, uh, you know, May uh, 15th in Rochester can, you know, we can have anything from snow to 75 and sunshine. And uh, it's, it's, you know, I think it's in the back of the mind of, of just about everybody at Oak Hill that, you know, if we have 75 and sunshine, uh, we'll have another PGA. And if we have 55 and, and sleet, um, we might not. And uh, um, again, I'm not on the future tournaments committee. I don't know, but I think it's interesting that the uh, club has reached back out to the USGA and is hosting one of their tournaments. Uh, coming up so that, you know, we've been in a rotation with the PGA now for quite a while and uh, seeing another USGA tournament on the schedule doesn't surprise me. Um, you know, we'll see. Um, um, you know, not a big fan of quote unquote global warming, but uh, if we had a 75 and sunny May 15th through the 21st and make me pretty happy and a whole lot of other people too. So, yep. That's definitely, I know we have another question in person, but we also have a question online. If you could talk a little bit more about four acres. Four aces. So the four aces is a great story. It, it's a, um, uh, it happened during the 1989 U S open. Uh, this was the sixth hole of the par three. It was one of Fazio's holes. And uh, it had a lobe in the front right that created a little, a little valley. And um, I think it was during the third round of the U.S. Open. Uh, I think it was P.J. Boatwright and a fellow named uh, um, Morrigan, uh, who was the uh, agronomist, the USGA's agronomist, were setting the pins on a Saturday uh, or, or on a Friday night. And on six, they, they put the pin right at the base of this little valley. And walking away, one said to the other, uh, that could be a hole in one, and to which the other replied, maybe more than one. Well, by background in the... Uh, 88 prior U.S. Opens, there had only been 17 holes in one. Well, on this par three, on Saturday morning, we had four within a matter of about two and a half hours, and um, which is totally unheard of. And uh, somebody I know was the was the score, the scorer on that hole. So when he would, after each hole, he would call in the scores of how the players did. And he called in the first hole in one. And uh, and the uh, the folks at the other end of the radio said, oh, that's great, that's fantastic, so on and so forth. And uh, after the second hole in one, he called it in and they said, oh, no, 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 we already got it, we already got it. Um, so, and then when the third hole in one, uh, he called in and there was a long silence on the phone 
or on the radio and, and somebody said, uh, we're, we're going to send out a replacement. Uh, evidently, they <laughs> they thought he'd had too much to drink or something, but they, they were questioning that. And of course, then the, there was a fourth hole in one. Um, Tim Morrigan, the, the, the agronomist uh, for the USGA at the time, right after the play, uh, went out and um, immediately took that flag off the pole off the uh, stick and, and put a replacement flag up and then went about over the next uh, year or so getting all four players to uh, sign the flag. Um, the four balls are at the USGA's uh, museum in Far Hills. Uh, we have uh, Mark Wiebe's club uh, and, um, and then about three years ago, Tim Morgan called me. He said, "I've got something for you. It belongs to Oak. It belongs at Oak Hill." And he gave us the the flag uh, that flew over the sixth hole on that day. And uh, I created a little display around it. Interesting that it, a uh, it was a Harvard mathematician who calculated the odds of that many holes in one in that short period of time during a U.S. Open. And the odds he calculated came out to 410 trillion to one. And uh, so it, it's a rarity. And uh, if, if you ever come to Oak Hill and want to visit the clubhouse, let me know and I'll show you the display. Yeah. So that's the story of the four aces. Is, wow, fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Um, we had uh, two more questions, and then we do sure. want to talk about your uh, um, your your experience overseas, you know, certainly ah. since, you know, since, okay, since sure. we definitely want to hear about the Swedish ancestor, or your, your time in Sweden. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the, the one question that we had uh, that online that was texted to me was regarding the the cost of you know hosting these majors you know uh, with thousands of people there and you know obviously it's it's a major type of event we're not, I don't I, I'm sure you probably don't have a, a an actual dollar number but how does the how does the club make out on this I mean <laughs> it seems like it'd be pretty expensive well it is it it's a joint effort between the PGA and the club and there is a uh, you know, there's a contract in terms of splitting the revenue uh, and sharing the costs. Um, you know, uh, when you say thousands of people, I, I believe the estimate is 220,000 people will be there over that, uh, that uh, seven day period with you know, the three days of practice and then the four days of play. So there are going to be a lot of people there and the costs are shared um, and the uh, the revenue is shared. Uh, I don't know the particulars of the contract for this year. Um, the PG, the majors are, you know, where you can make money. I know in 03, the club made something north of $1.5 million on the deal. Uh, I know that in 2013, um, uh, not so good. <laughs> you know, again, it was a function of the contract. The earlier contract, uh, 03, was in the heyday of Tiger, and, and um, 13, uh, much less so, and um, the contracts had changed both for uh, with television, uh, but but again, you know, those are those are just approximations. It, it's a very very significant uh, project. I mean, they're building. Um, you you go to the club now, and they're, they're just they're, they're just building these huge areas for corporate tents and hospitality and the PGA center is, is just going to be enormous. Um, it is a big, big deal. Um, I think there was a second part to that question and I forgot what it was, but you know, um, oh, well, the only other thing I was going to say is that part of the way that the club is compensated too, is that 
if there are changes that the PGA wants uh, um, then on the course or uh, on around the facilities, lots of times they pay for it, but the club then benefits from it. So, uh, you know, um, that's, that's, that's another way that the club benefits but you know i think the the financial benefits go beyond uh just how much money they make it's it's the reputation of the course i mean we have a three or four year waiting list now to join oak hill uh, we're able to charge significantly more uh than other clubs in the area as our initiation um and um um, and we have a lot of guests play and, um, and global membership. And that's all I'm quite certain because of the history um, that, uh, of our major championship tournament. So it, finance, the finances show up in more than, more than just what they make at the end of a tournament. Mm, most definitely. Uh, how did you find your way to Sweden? And uh, the did you golf when you were in Europe? <laughs> well, number one, I didn't start golfing until I was in my mid thirties, mid to late thirties. I grew up as a boy. I grew up about a block and a half from a golf course, and my family was not golfers, so I didn't golf. But I, I would load up a couple of jugs of Kool Aid and take them down in my wagon and sell the the golfers uh, Kool Aid. And uh, this was the beginning of my entrepreneurial experiences. And I got a little bit older. My mother would let me walk the perimeter of the course and I'd find golf balls and I'd wash them up, put them in egg cartons. And as I like to say, sell them to the poor guy who lost it the day before. And um, so I, as a child, I grew up loving being around the golf course, but I didn't play until my mid to late thirties. Uh, so I did not play in Sweden. Um, I was a uh, chosen to be a Rotary International Exchange student um, in 1964. Uh, I was a um, uh, between my junior and senior year in high school. Um, and uh, it took a little while to get everything organized, but I went from a family of three boys to a family of three girls in southern Sweden. I lived in, uh, you know, the, in Skona, the province of Skona, in a little town called Pomalila, and um, where my uh, Swedish father was a yarn handler. And um, I like to tell people that I. I uh, graduated from the Samrial School in there, uh, taking all my examinations in Swedish. Uh, but don't ask me to speak Swedish because that was nearly 60 years ago. <laughs> and but I did. I enjoyed. Uh, I enjoyed my travels and I enjoyed learning Swedish. You know, uh, especially when I would travel, uh, you know, I would not let on that I was American because once people knew you spoke English, of course, they wanted to practice their English and wouldn't let me practice my Swedish. Um, and I always joke that I learned, you know, living in, in Skona, uh, which had just 300 years earlier, which is a blink in Europe, uh, uh, been Danish. Uh, I'd learned to speak Swedish with a Southern accent and, uh, I, I, you know, I'd be in Stockholm and speaking to somebody and they'd look at me, kind of cock their head and go, you know, <laughs> and um, yeah, thinking that I was Danish, but, um, you know, um, I was lived in Sweden from 1965 until uh, mid year 1966, about 14 months. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. Um, um, you know, I I, um, I think of it often. Um, um, you know, we were close enough that you could hop on the train and go to Malmo or over to Copenhagen. Um, but I also traveled extensively through Europe uh, as uh, my my uh, high school graduation trip. 
uh, other trips with the, the with you know a group of us students would organize. Um, traveling back then, Sweden of course was neutral, and so uh, we would uh, traveled quite a bit through East Germany. Uh, I um, um, came back with a a. a, a I'm not quite sure how to phrase it, but a great appreciation for the country that we live in. You have no idea of the conditions of people in East East Germany, uh, what they live through. I mean, I watched somebody try to escape uh, from the train and soldiers chasing after the person. I spent an afternoon in the Berlin, East Berlin Bahnhof, the train station, and there was no place to find food. There was, there was no food. And we went out to walk around and the city is absolutely desolate. There was no restaurants, no shops, no food. And uh, watching cars with three or four men in them staring at us and driving by. And we just decided to go back to the, uh, to the train station. I mean, um, uh, that was that was an experience, um, and uh, you know, um, um, I, I don't know. I mean, to have spent time in such a, a, an authoritarian government or a country like that, you really uh, learn to appreciate what we have in the United States. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Most, yeah. Most yeah. definitely. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. 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 So, I had a great time. I loved it in Sweden, and uh, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. I'm ashamed to say I've not been back. Uh, my my Swedish is a little rusty, uh, <laughs> and with and with a, and with quite a distinct accent as well too. So uh, <laughs> no worries. But we definitely need to have you back so we can. Well, uh, just we just scratch the surface here when we're talking about the history of golf in Western York. But your experiences overseas and with so many other things and. Uh, I, I think would definitely be a fascinating topic, uh, you know, to to cover as well too. So uh, we will definitely have you back, for, um, Fred, and then we can uh, tell us Svenska at that particular point as well too. So <laughs> the um, any other last minute questions or, or Fred, do you want to add anything um, just before we 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 conclude? I don't. If there are any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, yeah. I I could we, go like this for a long time. Oh, absolutely. And I and this boy, this 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 uh hour and 15 minutes flew by, absolutely flew by. But if there are any other questions, you can certainly uh email us here at the historical society. We can pass them on to Fred. Um uh, uh, we do have a record the recording here we have made, it will be made available to anybody who registered for this event. So you can certainly um uh you know watch that again and i'm sure that fred would be happy to answer questions outside of the of this event as well too i know you were also doing an interview also you mentioned earlier from a few years ago uh how you did the um uh, you know a number of interviews and put together the presentation for cbs news on the on the, the history of oak hill and the like and that got you know they're left on the cutting room on, on the editing room floor yeah. there uh but i know you're doing that as well for this coming up pga championship though as well something similar yeah well i believe they have between espn and cbs there's 110 hours of live television mm -hmm. uh i don't think there's going to be more than about uh 45 hours of actual golf so <laughs> so uh maybe maybe 50 but not you know uh so that leaves a whole lot of time they need to fill and so um the you know doing spots on history and and other aspects of of oak hill um yeah. and yes. so i've already done interviews with um well cbs um the pga uh espn um you know um um you know a, high, a highlight of 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 2013 for me was um uh, actually i was on the property with my brother nephew and judy my wife and uh my phone 
buzzed. It didn't ring, it buzzed. <laughs> and, um, and somebody said, are you on the property? And I said, yeah. And they said, we're going to send a cart over for you. Well, a cart during the PGA is like a limousine. And so the cart got me and Carrie Haig, who's the chief championship officer for the PGA said, come on, we need you to give a speed history of golf to all the, uh, the um, CBS sportscasters. So all of the CBS sportscasters and myself were wedged into this little trailer. And for about 45 minutes, I gave them a history of, of Oak Hill and they answered their questions. And uh, at the end, Jim Nance goes, Fred, can we have your cell phone number just in case? And I said, sure. And then when I when the cart took me back to where my brother and, and nephew and wife were, my brother goes, so, so what happened? What did they want? And I said, ah, oh, Jim Nance just wanted my cell phone number. And, uh, but, but anyway, uh, I, you know, I get off on these little stories like that, but, but during 13, they were going to do a large, a long spot on the historian's office. And that was the same day that Duffner shot the 63. So I ended up on the cutting room floor and not on television. But... <laughs> this year, this year will make a difference of it. And we're honored, absolutely honored that you <laughs> have been generous with your time that, yep. you know, that, that, you, you know, and that you have, uh, um, given us such a great introduction to this fascinating story. There's definitely more to come, and uh, and, and we'll have you back for sure, Fred, if you're willing. Good, good, good. you bet. Good. Hey, good. if anybody's interested, there are some spots on YouTube mm -hmm. that I did in 13. If you Google, if you go to YouTube and Google 2013 Hill of Fame, uh, and um, you know, you'll see some some of the videos that we did. But oh, anyway. that's great! And you know what? We'll post that as well in the comments section for the event uh, yeah. and the like. Do we have another question there? Or right, who's or is... going in this year? Who's going into the Hall of Fame this year? I'm sorry. Who's going into the Hall of Fame this year? Uh, I'm not sure that that's public yet, but I did just mention his name. Oh, um, we keep it secret. No worries. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll keep it quiet. We, of course, will. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I know for those of you who have been inspired or want to go to the PGA Championship this year, uh, you know, especially if you want to get there to the final round, those tickets have been gone for quite some time. But we had a generous donor who gave us uh, a uh, tickets uh, for the championship Sunday that includes uh, uh, dinner, drinks, accommodations. There's a hotel room that, that you'll get the night after. So for only twenty bucks, you can get those. Uh, you can buy a raffle ticket, and you get a you get a chance to you know win. Certainly for that, we have a QR code. We'll leave that up here afterwards at the end. So if you want to scan it for those of you who are attending online, if you want to get those raffle tickets. Uh, Cindy has them. Uh, and the like, if you want to renew your uh, your membership in the Historical Society or or sign up as a member of the Historical Society, you know, that's much less than 20 bucks. So you can certainly do that as well, too. Next month, we will be having a talk on history of bells ring out for ringing for joy. That will be in April of 2023 about the history of bells and the like. So we will certainly have that ready to go. So thank you again, Fred. Thank you for our volunteers. Thank you to Bemis Point uh, uh, Golf Club and the Tap House, Oak Hill Country Club. This was a wonderful, fascinating event. Do we have one more question there, Austin? Or are you just um, setting things up? Okay, great. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you.